Well, in that case, let me welcome everybody to what is indeed a, just a ghastly um, evening here. Uh, I'm sorry about the, the quick change in the organisation for tonight's meeting. Originally, um, obviously, um, Martin was keen to come up to the mills, but with the deteriorating weather, it just was too risky um, because the road was likely to close and we, we, uh, up to the mills because of um, trees. Can, uh, there was all sorts of issues, so we, we decided Zoom was the way forward. But unfortunately, David Patterson has now lost power due to the uh, storms. <laughs> He's got no electricity and happily, Graham McAteer is now hosting this meeting, but we can only do it on Zoom at the moment, not on the YouTube channel. So that's where we are just now, but I am delighted to say that we are here with Martin and our guest speaker for the evening. Um, there's only a couple of announcements quickly that I can make. One is from Tony about our um, society's calendar which is he's almost finished so thanks again Tony and there are only two or three that are still available for purchase so if anybody has missed out um, get in touch with either Tony or Graham McAteer and secure your copy and once again if there are items for the newsletter if you send these over to Jim Barber so that is just grand um, and where we get into <clears throat> I am absolutely delighted tonight to be able to welcome back, if not to the mills, at least to the society, Professor Martin Henry from the University of Glasgow. And I'm sure many of us will remember Martin's previous talks, quite unforgettable, telling us about the phenomenal first detections of gravitational waves. And that was six years ago. And we are incredibly pleased to have you back, Martin, to tell us what has been happening in that time in this really amazing field of work. So we'll take it over to you with your topic title, which is The Story So Far. So <laughs> thank you very much, Jane. That. No Excellent. problem. So let's uh, share my screen and we'll be good to go. So uh, you should be able to see the shared screen now. And I will just... That's perfect. So if we could make sure everybody's muted and then we can just get going. Great. Excellent. Right. So um, a, a very warm welcome from sunny Glasgow. Um, so again, so sorry I wasn't able to join you in person, but there's always 2022. Uh, I look forward to um, coming up uh, on a future occasion. In fact, it is remarkable to think it's more than five years ago that I came to give a talk on this topic. I, I think I've made one further visit since then. See, it's always great to come and talk to the society, but I think on that occasion, I was looking at a different topic. But back in 2016, in June of 2016, I remember attending an event in the height of summer, and it was only a few months after we'd announced our first detection of gravitational waves. So, as June was hinting, a lot has happened since then, and that's what I'm really here to share with you this evening. So, let me just begin with another few words about who I am. So, I'm Professor of Gravitational Astrophysics and Cosmology at the University of Glasgow. When I visited before, I also had the additional responsibility of being head of the School of Physics and Astronomy. I stepped down from that role in 2020. I'd done it for eight years in total, and I have to say it's been a bit of a, a relief to have that burden at least removed, but my gravitational wave work has very much expanded to fill the void. So I'm as busy as ever, but I'm no longer in, in that leadership role within my school itself. But I do have a leadership role within the LIGO scientific collaboration. So more on that in just a moment. So gravitational astrophysics and cosmology is all about looking at extreme phenomena on the biggest possible scales in the universe. Cosmology is the branch of astronomy that's interested in questions around how big the universe is, how it began, why it's expanding. It's again quite a thought to think that we've been aware of the expansion of the universe for nearly a century, and yet we still haven't really got to grips with either what's driving that expansion, especially because in the last 20 years or so, we've come to realise that it's not only expanding, it's actually speeding up, it's accelerating in its expansion. And then the other thing we've not really got to grips with is precisely how fast it's expanding. And I'll come back to that a little later because we very much hope that gravitational wave observations will be able 
to um, bring some new ideas and some new uh, measurements to that big question. Uh, and then gravitational wave astronomy more generally is concerned with extreme phenomena in very compact and very dense stars that we call black holes and neutron stars, understanding what happens when they collide and indeed testing Albert Einstein's picture of gravity that he developed in his general theory of relativity. So that's a lot of ground to cover, but I'm going to do my best in the next 45 minutes or so to at least touch on all of those topics and give you a flavour of how our new field of gravitational wave astronomy is tackling some of these big questions to do with cosmology, to do with the nature of gravity itself, to do with the properties of black holes and neutron stars. Now, um, in focusing on those, essentially we're recognising that those really are the best candidates for us to detect gravitational waves. And again, I'll expand on that in the, the coming minutes. But there's going to be sources of gravitational waves out there that aren't black holes and neutron stars. So although I have a lot to cover in terms of updating you and what we've learned in the last six years, we very much hope that there'll be a few more surprises around the corner. So I think there's every chance that in future visits, hopefully to Dundee, um, not thwarted by the weather or by, by global pandemics, that I can come and tell you about um, some future discoveries that we don't even know about yet. But I'll make do with what we do know about so far, which is a lot about black holes and neutron stars. So I mentioned before that I'm a member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. So LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And we'll say a bit more in a few minutes about what um, that means. How does LIGO actually work? And there's a nice infographic here that was prepared by the, um, the Nobel Foundation, no less, because um, as many of you may know, um, LIGO was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2017, three senior members of LIGO. But they acknowledged that this was very much a team effort. And indeed, that team effort now ex extends not just to LIGO, but to our partners, Virgo and CAGRA. The Virgo collaboration is based around the detector, which is in Pisa in Italy. And the CAGRA detector um, is under development, but really at a very mature stage of development and all set to join us in making um, observations in 2022. So more on that towards the end of my talk. But again, it's absolutely appropriate to acknowledge the vast army of people who uh, contribute to this field. I'm not speaking formally on behalf of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, but I certainly want to acknowledge um, all of those colleagues who have contributed to all that I'm going to discuss uh, this evening with you. So again, if we take ourselves back to 2016, when I came to do that special lecture on the very first detection, as I said, that was only a few months after we had announced that detection. The detection itself actually took place in 2015, on the 14th of September of 2015. But it took us about five months to be absolutely sure that we got our story straight and that we had indeed detected gravitational waves. So how did we do that? And then we'll talk about the detection that we made, just a quick recap on that first event, and then we'll be onwards to talk about all that we've learned since then. I mentioned the Nobel Prize already, and it's important to stress that in giving the award to Ray Weiss and Barry Barish and Kip Thorne, this was acknowledging not just the huge number of people contributing to the field now, but maybe even more importantly, the number of scientists who devoted their careers for many decades to develop the field of gravitational wave astronomy. And I feel almost embarrassed not to tell you more about that. But the truth is, if I tell you all about the early history of the field up to the point of that first detection, there won't be enough time to tell you about all the great advances since. But I can recommend going on to YouTube, take a look at their Nobel Prize lectures from 2017. If you just do a Google search for 2017 Nobel Prize physics lectures, you'll find them right away. And they do a, a terrific job of explaining how we got to that point, what had led through several decades to get to these amazing detectors, the most sensitive scientific instruments ever built, and how they were capable of detecting these gravitational waves. 
So what exactly are gravitational waves? Well, again, this is just a, a brief recap of some of the ideas from my earlier lecture, because I appreciate that not everyone was maybe present for that, and you may have, have not followed the details of this field all that closely over recent years. But in the end, it all goes back to Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein's picture of gravity that he published, that he developed and then published in 1915 and 1916, which rethought the whole notion of gravity, not as a force between massive bodies, but as a, a curving, a warping of space and time themselves. And indeed, he showed that you need to think of space and time together as a unified entity that we refer to as space-time. This little phrase here on this slide is attributed not to Einstein, but to John Wheeler, another very famous physicist from a little later in the 20th century. And John Wheeler summed it up really neatly. He said that in, in Einstein's picture of gravity, general relativity, space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. The presence of matter, and indeed energy in the universe, shapes the shape of space-time itself. It produces a curvature, a, a bend in space-time, just like the cartoon is illustrating by imagining how the Earth's mass is deforming the space-time around it. And then that deformed, curved space-time will determine how other matter, and indeed light and gravitational waves, will travel through space-time. So in the vicinity of the Earth, our satellite, the Moon, follows a circular orbit around the Earth, according to Einstein's way of thinking about gravity, because the Moon is just following those natural curved contours of space-time, a bit like you know, the lines on a, a massive trampoline that's depicted in the cartoon. And well, it's important to realize that that picture of gravity was built upon our understanding of electromagnetism. So it came on a lineage from James Clark Maxwell in the middle of the 19th century, and then Einstein's first major masterwork, which was special relativity in 1905, the early years of the 20th century. And in developing special relativity, Einstein was trying to make sense of Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. And the fact that they predicted that light, all the forms of light that you see on this slide here, travel at the same speed, travel in, a, in the vacuum of empty space at 300,000 kilometers per second. So Einstein saw this as a very deep idea and to kind of preserve the mathematical structure of Maxwell's equations, he had to make a very bold leap of the imagination, which was to say, that the speed of light would be measured the same regardless of how you yourself are moving. And in his theory of special relativity, a consequence of that statement, which again was to, to make sense of Maxwell's equations and their internal structure of the electromagnetic field, as it's called, a consequence of that was that space and time themselves are, were no longer absolute, that they too depended on how you were moving to preserve that constancy of the speed of light. And then it took Einstein another 10 years to go from that idea of special relativity, describing the structure of space-time for observers moving at a constant speed, to build in the notion of accelerated observers. Because key to that was another really big idea, the equivalence of gravity and acceleration. So space-time curvature is what we think of in Einstein's theory of as the manifestation of gravity, but it's also the manifestation of accelerated motion. If you accelerate, if you change your speed, change your velocity, then that distorts the space-time around you, just like a gravitational field will. So Einstein's general relativity predicted as a consequence of that accelerated motion, a new form of radiation gravitational waves, and they too would travel at the speed of light. And, and that's no coincidence. It's because it's hardwired into the theory following its, its development from the, the ideas of Maxwell about electromagnetism through special relativity to general relativity. So these gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. They are not electromagnetic waves. They're a different type of radiation altogether, but they do share that common speed. Essentially, gravitational waves are ripples in space and time themselves. 
the fabric of space-time is disturbed when you have masses accelerating. Just like you get electromagnetic waves when charges accelerate, when masses accelerate, you get gravitational waves. So when you have a changing gravitational field caused by that changing acceleration of two bodies, for example, two stars orbiting around each other, that will produce gravitational waves. But how do you detect them? Well, that's a real challenge because space-time is incredibly stiff. It takes compact, dense stars like black holes and neutron stars moving incredibly fast, accelerating as they orbit each other very close together to produce a shaking of space-time that's enough, that's sufficient for us to detect. So to give some kind of numbers on that, typical gravitational waves produced by something like two neutron stars orbiting each other out there in the universe, we would expect that those ripples in space-time, by the time they reach us, would disturb our patch of space-time by about one thousandth the size of a proton, the subatomic particle in the nucleus of an atom, or to put it in even more everyday terms, about a million millionth the width of a human hair. So how are you going to build a detector that's sensitive enough to pick up signals that are so incredibly weak? Well, building an artificial gravitational wave generator is never going to um, cut it. Because although gravitational waves are accelerated, are generated by accelerating masses, you need super dense stars like the aforementioned neutron stars or indeed black holes moving close to the speed of light to produce a signal that we could ever hope to measure. So let's just put some numbers on that. I don't have many equations or anything like that in my talk. It's not that kind of talk, but I think it's worth just throwing in the odd number here and there to just give a sense of the magnitude of the field. That, um, that, that, that we're describing this evening. So let's say you took two one-ton masses, two metres apart, and had them spinning around each other at a really unfeasibly high rate, one kilohertz, that means a thousand revolutions per second. You know, you may think it's a bit noisy and rattly if you're, um, the spin cycle in your washing machine is going, but here we're talking uh, you know, ra rather more um, violent than that. So. I'm not sure this would be terribly feasible to have two one-ton masses um, spinning around each other that fast, but the point is, even if they did, and you took yourself off to a comparatively safe distance of, say, 300 metres away, then the fractional change in the curvature of space-time, this is a, a quantity that we define in, in, in the letter H, it's, it's representing the strain of space-time, kind of how much space-time is being deformed by, that would be the remarkably small number of about one part in 10 to the 37. That's a one in 37 zeros. So that's just unimaginably small. We couldn't ever hope to design a detector capable of measuring that kind of effect. And, you know, I, I mentioned this just because, of course, we can generate electromagnetic waves very easily. That's how I get to talk to you this evening um, over the internet and using Zoom. So it was only a few decades between James Clerk Maxwell discovering theoretically that electromagnetic waves could exist, and then people like Edison and Marconi and so on being able to generate electromagnetic waves in the lab. But as the numbers on this slide illustrate, the equivalent for gravitational waves is well beyond our grasp. We don't ever envisage being able to generate measurable gravitational waves in the lab, you know, even if you could have two one-ton masses spinning around each other as described here. On the other hand, if we use the cosmos as our laboratory, it's a different story. So if you had two neutron stars, about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, orbiting each other 200 times a second, that still feels very fast, but we've found systems that do exactly this, then even if that system was 100 megaparsecs away, that's about 300 light years, just over 300 light years, then the strain in space time that that would produce would be about one part in 10 to the 21, one part in a one with 21 zeros. Now that's still a very, very tiny number, but that's the kind of sensitivity that the LIGO detectors have achieved. So absolutely no, to the laboratory-based gravitational wave generator, but the cosmos 
as a gravitational wave generator. Much more promising. That's what our Nobel laureates and all of their colleagues were working towards for several decades leading up to 2015. And that's where we arrived in this century with the LIGO detectors having achieved that sensitivity. In fact, there was an early version of the LIGO detectors where they didn't quite get that far. Um, but as we'll see in a moment, they were enhanced, they were upgraded, and that was what changed the goalposts, moved the goalposts to make them sensitive enough to achieve that remarkable required sensitivity. So I said before that LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And there are two LIGO sites, one in Livingston, Louisiana, that's shown in the top right, and Hanford, Washington, in the bottom left. That's about 3,000 kilometers apart, so either end of the continental US. And the way that they work, well, that's where the clue is in the acronym, laser interferometer. What we're doing is using laser beams, sending the beams back and forth along four kilometer arms at a very, very high vacuum with most of the atoms um, removed because even hitting an atom would be enough to disturb the laser beam. But what that creates is the opportunity to look for changes in the interference pattern of the laser light when it's recombined after bouncing off those mirrors at the ends of the arms. And when a gravitational wave passes by, it will stretch and squeeze the space-time in which the LIGO detectors are sitting. And that will alter that interference pattern in a manner that we can look for. We can look for changes in that interference pattern as an indication of the passage of a gravitational wave. Now remember, the kinds of sensitivity we need is one million millionth the width of a human hair, or if you want to put it another way, it's about the width of a hair compared with the distance from the Earth to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star beyond the sun. So this is a, an incredible sensitivity. But that's what the LIGO detectors can achieve. But the problem is, of course, a lot of other sources of disturbance can swamp that kind of signal. This is a rather complicated looking figure. All you need to take away from it is a couple of things. One, that there's a lot of different sources of noise. They have quite exotic names and you know, maybe another time it would be interesting to focus much more on that as part of my talk. But um, those sources of noise depend on the frequency of the disturbance. So at some frequencies, certain sources of noise dominate, like for example, seismic noise at low frequencies, that's really just the ground shaking. And then at other higher frequencies, it's different sources of noise. Like for example, it might be noises to do with the suspension of the mirrors at the ends of the arms. But there's a kind of sweet spot in the middle, a few hundred hertz, where our sensitivity is best. And that's where we've got the best chance of being able to hear, listen to those signals from um, far out in space. Now, why do I say listen to them? Well, it's because that sweet spot happens to be a range of frequencies that the human ear can hear. So gravitational waves are not sound waves, but we often think of them as sound waves because again, that's consistent with the, the name that we all always give to the sources of disturbance in an experiment. We talk about them as experimental noise. So in that sense, we're trying to hear a faint signal above a very loud noise background. And a good analogy for that, um, uh, we're just going to explore next. Um, just before we do, let, let's again, just put a little bit more detail onto the signal side of things. So as well as all the technological advances in building the detectors, in the years leading up to the first detection, another significant um, series of advances was in the, the theoretical side of things on modeling what the signal should look like when, for example, you have two black holes colliding with each other, as the little cartoon down here is illustrating. So the black holes are just about to merge and that's sending ripples spreading out. And we can see that what you get is a pattern of disturbance, of distortion in space-time that grows in amplitude, but it also increases in frequency. The peaks and the troughs get closer together. And that's because as the black holes, in this case, are spiraling in around each other, they're going faster and faster, and that's shaking up space-time, producing gravitational waves, 
with an ever higher frequency. Then the black holes merge, space-time shakes some more, things settle down. That's what we call the ring down phase that you see here. And then the event has passed. So a good analogy here, which I often use in, in outreach, particularly in schools, okay, you wouldn't see a scene like this in the COVID era, but here we've got a packed um, dining hall, and it must be really hard to overhear conversations of the people at your table because of all the background noise. So that's pretty much the challenge that we face with gravitational wave detection. We've got this enormously loud background, and we're trying to hear very faint signals on top of that. So key to making that happen were advances that led up to that first detection in 2015. And I'm proud to say that those uh, in large part were led by the UK with indeed Glasgow being the lead institution. It was all to do with reducing the noise from the suspension of the mirrors in the arms. So uh, we, we referred to that as one of the sources of noise on that graph a few slides back. And basically, um, Again, this is a fascinating topic that, that deserves much more time than I can give it. But basically, um, by rethinking and redesigning the way in which the mirrors were suspended, improving the coatings of the mirrors, and just seeking to isolate them much better from the surrounding environment, all of that was reducing the noise. It was keeping the noise down um, so that those incredibly faint signals could be heard. So all of that led us to that first detection. So now let's just take a brief look at what we learned from that before we plow on to what's happened since. So back when I visited in 2016, I was able to tell you about this first detection that we announced in February of that year, following the detection itself that occurred the previous September. And we deduced that it was a collision between two black holes, each of about 30 times the mass of the sun, they had been spiraling in towards each other, possibly for millions of years, but we only captured the very final moments of that in spiral before the merger, and then the ring down when you've got one black hole that just shakes a bit, and then you're left with space-time going quiet again. So this all happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It happened of order 1.3 billion years ago, and yet those gravitational waves have been spreading out through the universe to finally be detected by us all those years later. So here's the animation, I probably showed this in 2016 as well, that we produced um, informed by the science that, that we measured, by the data that we measured, um, simulating what was going on as those two black holes merged. So you can see the disturbance of space-time, let's just play it again. You can see the disturbance of space-time the bending of space-time, and you can see that at the moment that the black holes merge, we get this burst of gravitational wave energy represented just by the red spike. But of course, actually, what it's represented by is the ripples in space-time that the LIGO detectors were able to pick up. Now, I mentioned that the two black holes, their initial mass were about 30 times that of the sun. Well, actually, we were able to work out that one of them was about 29 times the mass of the sun, the other one about 36. So add that together, you get a total mass of 65, but the final black hole remnant had a mass of only 62 times the mass of the sun. Because in the collision, the release of gravitational wave energy that we see just represented in cartoon form as the red spike, released the equivalent of three times the mass of the sun in the form of gravitational waves. That burst of gravitational wave energy was released in just a fraction of a second, we can work out its associated power, because power is energy divided by time. And we get the energy by using Einstein's famous E equals mc squared, where c is the speed of light. I mentioned before, that's 300,000 kilometers per second. So putting all of that together, we worked out that remarkably, this event produced more gravitational wave power than about 50 times the light power, the luminous power, of all the stars in all the galaxies in the entire universe. Of course, it didn't last for very long, but instantaneously that gravitational wave power was just colossal. And that's connected with the point I made much earlier, which is that space-time is incredibly stiff. So when you can collide black holes together and in some sense break space-time, you release this vast reservoir of energy that's holding space-time together. And I think it was Darth Vader that said that you should never underestimate the power of the dark side of the universe. 
And it's quite a thought that that 50 times the luminous power of every star in the entire universe, that was released, we think, without any electromagnetic radiation whatsoever. So we really are probing the dark side of the universe. So that was 2060. So what's happened since? So the remainder of my talk is all about bringing us up to date. So the next big milestone was in 2017. That was when a third detector joined our global network. So we had LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston up until then. But in our second observing run, Virgo had also been upgraded to advanced Virgo. It's got three kilometer arms, but otherwise pretty similar physics um, uh, underpinning its operation. It's a laser interferometer, just like LIGO. And with a third detector, it allows you to pinpoint the position of, of from where the gravitational waves are coming much more precisely. So basically you get that position largely through the timing because the gravitational waves will arrive at an ever so slightly different time at different locations on the Earth. And the light travel time, because remember gravitational waves, according to Einstein, travel at the speed of light, the light travel time between those locations, well, basically let's take an example. If we look at this red ring here, then every point on that ring has got the same difference in light travel time between the Hanford and Livingston detectors. So if you have only got the two detectors operating and you get a certain time delay between the arrival of the signals, you can only say that it came from somewhere on that red ring. In principle, you can do a little better if you use extra information in what we call the polarization of the gravitational wave. But leaving that aside, you know, that's a bit of extra detail. The basic picture is that it's somewhere in that ring. That's all you know. But as soon as you've got a third detector, there's three different rings that can be um, considered in, in the same way. And where those rings intersect, well, that's a much smaller area on the sky. So you've pinpointed the location much more effectively. So the first example of this working to an advantage was on the 14th of August, 2017, because we saw a binary black hole merger, not so different from the very first detections, actually there'd been a couple more um, in between, but the binary black hole merger that we saw in 14th of August of that year was much better localized. It was pinpointed to about 60 degrees on the sky, about 10 times better or more, than the pinpointing of the previous events, including that very first one. Now, why was this important? Well, it gave us a fighting chance to go look for an electromagnetic counterpart. Now, we might not expect to see that when black holes collide. Doesn't mean we shouldn't look for it. But when neutron stars collide, we do expect an electromagnetic counterpart. And just three days later, that's exactly what we saw. So on the 17th of August, 2017, there was a burst of gamma rays detected by NASA's Fermi satellite and also ESA's integral satellite that arrived at the Earth about 1.7 seconds after LIGO and Virgo had detected a gravitational wave event. Well, actually, Virgo didn't see very much of a signal, but that was quite instructive in itself because um, there are always certain points in the sky where one of the detectors isn't terribly sensitive. And because we knew Virgo was working just fine because it's seen that other event just three days before, we knew, well, if Virgo hasn't seen something, that's really pinpointing the location pretty accurately. So in fact, what we were able to do was to narrow down the overlap of the location seen by LIGO and Virgo with the location seen by the gamma ray satellites to a region of the sky just about 30 square degrees and there were only a few dozen galaxies in that region of the sky. And one of them, this chap here, NGC 4663, we um, discovered was the host galaxy of the aftermath of that gravitational wave event. So what we'd seen was, it's called a chirp. And in fact, the black hole mergers produced chirps as well. But the chirp, in this case from two neutron stars, because they are much less massive, the chirp lasts a longer time. As the neutron stars orbit each other, they don't disturb space-time quite so much. They don't lose energy quite so rapidly as the black holes do, so the system doesn't evolve so fast. We'll come back to that in a few minutes as well. But there's the chart. Then 1.7 seconds later, we saw the burst of gamma rays. Now, 
we think that the gamma rays were traveling at exactly the same speed as the gravitational waves. It's just that they set off 1.7 seconds later. That's because it took a little time, a very little time, for the effects of the gravitational wave burst from the merging neutron stars to produce that burst of gamma radiation, what we call a gamma ray burst. So even if you say, well, we're not absolutely sure about that delay time, let's just allow for the fact that, you know, they could have set off at the same time and the gamma rays have lagged behind. That still allows us to put some very tight constraints on the speed of gravity compared with the speed of light, because this system we were able to work out is about 130 million light years away. So to only lag behind by 1.7 seconds over 130 million years says that the speed of gravity must be incredibly similar to the speed of light. Einstein says they're identical, but even experimentally now, this says that they are very, very close to zero, the difference in speed, if not exactly zero. So that was one of our first big discoveries from this event, sort of verifying or corroborating the idea from Einstein's theories that gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light. But this was by no means the last, because the next big thing we were able to do, because we'd identified the host galaxy, is we could use this event to measure the expansion rate of the universe. Now, that's a topic I've worked on for decades. It's one very close to my heart. And um, we'd been trying to do this really ever since the early decades of the 20th century, when Edwin Hubble, shown here, and Georges Lemaitre, and their ideas really gave birth to the whole notion of Big Bang cosmology, that the universe began with a Big Bang. The name was adopted some decades later, but the basic idea was already there from Hubble's time. It'd been expanding ever since. And there's a number we call the Hubble constant that measures that expansion rate. Now, to get the Hubble constant, you need a distance to galaxy, and you need to measure what's called its redshift, which is a measure of how fast it's moving away from us due to the expansion. So getting the redshift from the gravitational waves alone is highly problematic. Again, I'll come back to that um, briefly towards the end. But if you identify the host galaxy, you can get the redshift from the light that the galaxy emits, and then you get the distance from the gravitational waves. So this is the, a clear indication of what we call multi-messenger astronomy, using different messengers, on the one hand light, on the other hand gravitational waves, to combine and do something useful, to learn something about our universe. So what did we learn? Well, it's not that impressive, to be honest. What you see here is a graph showing our estimate of the Hubble constant. This is measured in a fairly unusual unit. It's called kilometers per second per megaparsec. But it's basically just a measure of how fast the universe is expanding. And what you see here is a big peak round about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But also important are the green and orange vertical bands because they represent measurements of this Hubble constant, not using gravitational waves, using more conventional astronomy techniques, which are absolutely state of the art. The trouble is they don't agree with each other. They're in conflict with each other, you know, based on the estimates that the astronomers have made of how accurate they can determine that Hubble constant. One group says, yep, yeah, I can determine it super accurately to be about 67 or 68. And another set of astronomers are saying, yep, yeah, I can detect it to be about 73, but without overlapping uncertainties. So something's wrong somewhere. And our hope is that gravitational waves will be able to help resolve that. Now, our first observation certainly doesn't because the uncertainty on the measurement of the Hubble constant is so broad. But hopefully things are going to change and that we will come to right at the very end of my talk. Let me just mention that this whole idea of measuring the Hubble constant and the uncertainties with that has really become a big deal in cosmology. It's referred to as the Hubble tension. So again, this looks a bit complicated, but it's really just trying to give us the sense of what's happened over the last 20 years. What's happened is that our measurements of the Hubble constant have got better and better. That's because the, the size of these vertical bars has shrunk. Those are what we call error bars. But these two camps have set up. One camp uses nearby measurements. That's um, denoted here by HST, Hubble Space Telescope. It's all to do with using 
supernovae and Cepheid variable stars and a variety of other um, calibrating techniques to get the local expansion rate fairly directly. And then there's another group of measurements that uses the cosmic background radiation, the radiation left over from the Big Bang itself, um, to effectively measure what the expansion rate was back then, and then extrapolate it 13 odd billion years forward. Now, you might think that's a process that's fraught with danger, but actually we understand, or at least we think we understand, the details of that extrapolation pretty well. So it's frankly quite surprising that these results disagree so much, and something's wrong somewhere. So here's our result with the neutron star merger on the 17th of August 2017, and our error bar, just like you could see effectively on the previous plot, is so big that we straddle all of those other measurements. So we can't say which one is right or not, at least not based on that first observation. But we're in the right ballpark, we're in the game, so to speak, and we really want gravitational waves to be playing their part to try and answer this question. The reason that's not a, a vain hope is that gravitational waves, as a way to get distances, bypasses a lot of the problems that have been identified with the other methods to get distances, either using the nearby method or, or the more distant universe. In both cases, there are uncertainties. Yes, we have uncertainties too, and at the moment ours are, are worse than the other methods, but they're different and therefore they provide an independent verification or, or sanity check. So even at that level, it's important that our results are already out there, but crucially, we want them to get better. Okay, I've spent quite a long time on that because that's laying the foundations for the, the final part of my talk that's coming up in just a few minutes. But what I want to do just before I get there is just flesh out a little bit what happened after 2017. So that incredibly busy week that we've just looked at where we got the binary black hole merger that kick-started Virgo's contributions and then we got the neutron star merger just three days later. Uh, well, you know, it really was quite a week not least because there was a total solar eclipse that I saw in the US to fold into that as well. So it takes something to make the solar eclipse not the most important astronomical event of the week, at least in my book, but it was um, an amazing time. But then um, that ended our second observing run. So the first observing run had involved the very first detection that we see up here, and then there were several more, and then our Second observing run began in 2017 in January. It ran through to August, but remember it was only August the 1st when Virgo got involved. So prior to that, it was just the two LIGO detectors. So what you see is all the events that we detected during that first and second observing runs. And we packaged that up together and called that our gravitational wave transient catalog one, GWTC1. We released that in December 2018, just about three years ago. And well, we had 11 events. So one of the things I was in charge of was our social media to support the release. And uh, you know, we came up with the nice tagline that our catalog goes up to 11, a sort of you know, a, a, a throwback to Spinal Tap. And again, just playing with this idea of thinking of gravitational waves as sound. They're not sound, but we can listen to the universe um, by representing these signals, these patterns as sound waves. What happened after that? Well, we basically spent more than a year upgrading the detectors. So we came back online in April 2019. And what we were doing in that time was making the, the, the mirrors and the instruments much more sensitive. So again, there's a, a great talk to be had just going into all the details of that. I don't work in that part, but a number of my colleagues in Glasgow do, and they played a really crucial role in getting the detectors even more sensitive between um, 2017 and then April 2019. So our third observing run was gonna run for a whole year from April 1st, actually more than a year because there was a break in the middle to improve the detectors again. So it was split into two parts, O3A and O3B. So we began again, as I said, on April 1st of that year. And another big change when this happened is that we began putting out alerts to the public immediately when we thought we had a gravitational wave candidate. Now, we only put out limited information, but we put out enough to give astronomers using 
conventional telescopes, optical telescopes, radio, so on, the best possible chance they had to go look on a portion of the sky. Now that had happened for the binary neutron star merger in August 2017, but that was only astronomers with whom we'd made a, a, a secret pact, if you like, a secret arrangement that we would release the data to them. We wanted to move beyond all that. You know, it wasn't such a big deal because we detected gravitational waves already. What we wanted was to maximize the science that comes out of all that. So sharing the information as early as we could was absolutely um, important. And again, one of my roles within the collaboration as chair of our communications and education division was to look after exactly how we would share that information, not just with professional astronomers, but with the general public. So that was all happening throughout um, those early months of the third observing run. And indeed, you could actually download an app and still available and nothing happening at the moment, of course, because we're offline right now, as I'll um, highlight in more detail in a few minutes. But this CHIRP app created by our colleagues in Birmingham University uh, has been downloaded many thousands of times. That means basically you would get an alert on your phone when a candidate event had occurred. And here's a, a very graphic way to see just how those improvements in the sensitivity were paying off. So observing run one, that was in 2015, uh, observing run two from early 2017 through to August of that year, and then observing run three beginning in 2019, uh, a very steep increase in event rate. Actually, it's interesting to note that the event rate had risen a bit even in observing run two. That wasn't due to anything we had done really. It was just that we got extraordinarily lucky during that week in August in 2017 where we got multiple events, not even just the ones that I've talked about, but some others as well. So that was a real purple patch, but we kept that momentum going because the detectors had been improved by the time 2019 came along. So the first half of 03 ran from April to um, October of uh, 2019, um, and then, uh, well, end of September, in fact, and then 03B, that was from November through to the following March. We did have to stop a little bit early because by March 2020, sadly, COVID was having an effect and basically um, all of our operations were shutting down. But what we released in that time, uh, all the way from run one to O3B, was a total of 60 candidate gravitational wave events. But we always suspected that there were probably more events in our data that didn't like jump out at us immediately, but that would emerge after more detailed and painstaking analysis. So that's basically how it's, it's panned out. Firstly, we had a number of special events that we announced from O3. And again, I could just do a talk on this. I'm only gonna spend a moment or two on it just to highlight a few um, aspects of these special events. So for example, we, we announced one that had been detected in April of 2019, April 12th, just a couple of weeks after we started observing. And this was at that time, the most uneven system that we detected. So the mass of one black hole was several times the mass of the smaller one. And that gives a somewhat different pattern of black holes when that event is observed. And there's more structure in the gravitational wave signal, a bit like having higher harmonics in a sound wave. So again, we played around a bit with that in our public outreach. You know, we talked about how we were getting that first harmonic that corresponds in musical terms to like a perfect fifth, um, you know, like the opening chord of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, so that was picked up a lot by the media at the time. And then just a few months later, in August of 2019, we got an event that was even more asymmetric. So this was, in fact, so asymmetric that we weren't even really sure if the lighter one was the lightest black hole we'd ever seen or the heaviest neutron star we'd ever seen. It was probably the former, but it was possible that this was the first black hole neutron star pair. And then actually I've jumped over this one um, in, in April of 2019, another event had occurred this time April 25th. It was the second neutron star merger that we'd seen. This is a kind of artist's impression of that. It was a lot more distant, so we didn't see an electromagnetic counterpart that time. If there had been one, like a gamma ray burst, and then uh, the event that's left behind what's 
called a kilonova, then it was probably too distant to be detectable. And the other problem was this event was not very well localized in the sky because it was actually only really a clear detection in one of the LIGO instruments. The other LIGO instrument was offline at the time and Virgo, it was kind of too far away for Virgo to see. So long story short, we're pretty sure it's a pair of neutron stars, but we didn't get the whole multi-messenger story that we had done in 2017. Last one to mention is 1905-21, so May of that year. And this was the heaviest black hole merger that we'd seen um, to that point, still is in fact. And this took us into the regime of what's called intermediate mass black holes, where the black holes are more than 100 times the mass of the sun. And basically they're so massive, we don't think that they would occur directly from the collapse of a star going supernova. You just wouldn't get a black hole that massive. Then I'll briefly touch on that in a few minutes time in relation to another context. Um, so in fact, a possibility is that these black holes are the result of a series of mergers, like a hierarchy of mergers. Two smaller black holes merged, another two merged, and then the merged bigger black holes in turn merged. Now, you know, that might seem unlikely, but there are some astrophysical environments where that kind of thing could happen, and this might be one such example. Now, I'm conscious um, time is marching on, so let me press on. These exceptional events that I've just highlighted there were all from the first half of 03. And in October of last year, October 2020, we announced the O3A catalogue, and we called that GWTC2. So it was the, the second of our publicly released catalogues, and it contained a substantial number of events of about 50 we'd got up to by that point. And there were lots of ways you could represent all the data. You could look at um, their masses, so that's actually missing on this slide. It's along the horizontal axis. And then Q here is the ratio of the masses. And again, the, the little extended colored regions are an indication of our uncertainty in that. So frankly, quite a lot of them, we weren't really sure of these numbers all that precisely, but we were starting to build up a picture of the population as a whole. Let me then jump forward to June of this year. That was where we began making announcements about the second part of the third observing run. So remember that was from November through to March of 2020, November 2019 to March of 2020. And during that period, we caught two events that we were more confident were black holes merging with neutron stars. That one back in August of 2019, we weren't so sure. It was probably just two black holes, but with one of the black holes being very light. But in the case of these two events, it really did look as if we were seeing a black hole and a neutron star together. So they both happened in January 2020, one on January 5th, the other one on January 10th. And we announced these in um, June of this year. It took a long time to analyze the data. We wanted to be absolutely sure. We didn't see an electromagnetic counterpart, but the structure in the waveforms was consistent with this unevenness in the masses, the black hole being much more massive than the neutron star in both cases. Now, if it was two black holes, you know, we couldn't completely rule that out, even though our favorite hypothesis was a black hole and a neutron star, then again, the pattern of structure in the gravitational wave signal would be much more um, complicated. So extra harmonics, you know, just like playing extra notes in a musical chord. So that was interesting in itself, and even if you had a black hole and a neutron star colliding together, you would still get that structure. But you could have a situation where the neutron star was effectively swallowed whole. So in this cartoon animation, you can see, well, you still had the complicated pattern in the gravitational wave signal, but the neutron star in the cartoon illustration, it was just got gobbled up by the black hole in, in almost no time. The other scenario that could happen with a black hole neutron star merger is something a bit more like this. So what you see here is a black hole and a neutron star going about a merger that's much more extended in time. So the neutron star gets torn apart and leaves its innards for all to see, hopefully, in a kind of disk around the black hole. So we didn't see that in either of those two cases. But again, it might just be 
that the stars were too far away to detect that neutron star disruption and all the material being left behind. We certainly want to look for that kind of thing with optical telescopes, but we didn't see it with these 2020 January events. So effectively, it means that we're looking for kind of two patterns of behavior. On the one hand, the neutron star gets gobbled whole, a bit like, you know, Cookie Monster gobbling cookies. On the other hand, it's a bit more like Pac-Man, where, you know, the, the bits of neutron star material are around for a while, and the black hole gobbles them up, but more slowly, more systematically. So the events seem to fit more the Pac-Man model than the Cookie Monster model. Um, but, you know, hey, um, it, we're not quite sure exactly how this is all going to shape up in, in future studies. Uh, it, as I said, it could be that because these events were so far away, um, then actually there was uh, material left over, but we just didn't see it. So um, looking at, at these uh, black hole neutron star mergers, that's the only exceptional events that we've announced from the second half of the catalogue so far, but we have now announced the whole of that second half of the catalogue, the O3B catalogue, and indeed we've sort of taken a step back now and folded in all the other events from way back to 2015. So we call that combined cumulative catalogue GWTC3, our third transient catalogue, and we just announced that at the beginning of November. So this is really kind of hot off the press. So we're now up to 90 confirmed events. And just to give you a sense of the growth in that number, well, here's a plot that we've been producing since the beginning. And uh, we call it our stellar graveyard plot. It's colleagues in Northwestern University in the US that put this together. And you can see the masses of the black hole mergers, one or two neutron stars as well. Um, and yep, you know, it's quite a family we've got now. And, other ways that we represent that family are this nice poster, for example, produced by colleagues in Australia. And in fact, um, I put that on Twitter today because today is you know, Black Hole Friday. And it's actually Black Friday, of course, but NASA created this as a thing, um, a, a particular hashtag a few years ago, that why should it just be Black Friday? Let's make it Black Hole Friday. So we wanted to contribute to that today. And let's just see how that masses in the stellar graveyard plot has evolved. So here was from 01 and 02, that's the 11 events that we announced in GWTC1. And then here's GWTC2, released last October. That's including also the first half of the third observing run. And then GWTC3 takes us up to our 90 confirmed events to date. So I'm almost done, but I want to, if, if again, I, I hope I haven't gone over, I haven't actually done this talk before, you know, you're, you're getting the kind of world premiere of it, if you like. Uh, because our new results are, are so new, and I, I maybe have misjudged a little bit how long it would take to go through, um, but if it's okay to just maybe use about another five minutes, then I will um, just bring you fully up to date on one specific part of the O3B story. Uh, so I, I want to just briefly look at the population of events that we're now detecting. So uh, this is, you can see both axes this time. The chart mass is, is, a, is a way of expressing a kind of combined mass for the two objects together. Uh, so it's related to a, a certain function of the individual masses. So what this plot is showing is that for some systems, we define that we measure it really rather accurately, but for other ones, we don't know so well. The chart mass isn't all that precisely measured. And even more poorly measured is a quantity that we call the effective and spiral spin which is to do with how the black holes are oriented, how the neutron stars are oriented as they orbit around each other. So these numbers are really important because they can help us understand the origin and the evolution of these systems. So we're now moving from studying them individually to trying to understand the population. And to kind of look at where all that's taking us, well, think of it like this. If you have two compact objects, black holes and neutron stars that form as an isolated binary system, then you might well expect that their spins would be aligned with each other. It would be kind of pointing in the same way. It's a little bit like the fact that all the planets in the solar system, their rotation axes generally point in the same direction. There's one or two exceptions. We think that's 
maybe because of collisions in the early solar system, but that's generally the story. So in the same way, if you've got an isolated binary system where the two, two compact objects originate, then you might expect their spins to be aligned. But if, on the other hand, the binary arose because you just had a lot of stars all close together, sort of changing partners a bit like, you know, in a, a sort of extremely violent strip the willow, then you would expect in that case that their spins would be more random. And there's several different possible environments where that could happen. It could be like in a globular cluster or a young star cluster, or even the disk of an active galactic nucleus. So in all of those second situations, you would expect that the spin distribution might be different than if all your binaries formed in isolation. So that's the kind of reason why we want to start using things like spin to understand the population properties. We also want to understand the masses themselves. So this again looks very complicated, but it's from our latest paper, just from a few weeks ago, that's constraining the, the distribution of masses in our population. So like, it's like, you know, these um, studies that they might do to try and get the distribution of heights or weights in a population of people. And you can draw some inferences from that about our state of health, perhaps. So this is kind of what we're trying to do with our black holes. And what we see is that the black holes are not an equal number across all masses. There are certain bumps in the mass distribution, around 10 times the mass of the sun, about 18 times the mass of the sun, that's up here, and then about 35 times the mass of the sun. So understanding why those bumps should occur, what kind of formation processes makes the universe favor some black hole masses compared with others, those are questions that are very much on our thoughts now as we expand our population. And what we also see is no cutoff above 50 solar masses, or at least no sharp cutoff, there's a gradual decline. Now what that might mean is that there really is some kind of hierarchical formation process going on because this PISN it stands for Pair Instability Supernova. Again, the physics of that's pretty complicated, but what it basically says is that you shouldn't get a black hole formed from a supernova with a mass of more than about 50 times the mass of the sun. So the fact that we are getting such black holes suggests that they didn't form directly from a supernova, from a star collapsing, but perhaps a bit more like that cartoon we saw before, where you've got a hierarchy of black hole mergers ultimately producing a really massive black hole at the end of that process. And indeed, we're also seeing some signs of evolution in the merger rate. In other words, that the rate of mergers now is different from what it was when the universe was younger. And that's not surprising because the rate at which stars were forming, we can measure that using light, also changes with time, changes with redshift. So piecing all of that together and tying together the gravitational wave observations with the electromagnetic observations is very much what we're up, we're up to now. So the final thing I want to talk about, um, again, if, if I can just um, beg your indulgence for a few more minutes, is, is the area that I've been focusing on most in this new um, O3B catalogue. And it's all to do with what we already did with the binary neutron star merger to measure the Hubble constant, but now trying to do it with black holes. Now that's tricky because the black holes don't have an electromagnetic counterpart that tells you what the host galaxy is. We'll get to that in just a second. But firstly, what I want to do is just briefly show you how you could get the distance in the first place. So in fact, to encourage you, if you want to have a play with this, there's a Java applet on one of our websites, our Open Science Center, where you can change the waveform, change the mass, and change the distance. Now, this is just a screenshot, so I can't do it directly. But what I'm going to do is um, just show a few seconds worth of a video that essentially um, describes the same phenomenon. So let's share that with you. On the 14th of September 2015, one of these tiny gravitational wave signals was detected by LIGO. By comparing the signal to the predicted signal, scientists are able to find out more about the origin of the gravitational waves. To determine the mass of the black holes and their distance, we can compare with theoretical models. The parameters of the model are adjusted until the predicted signal matches up to the data. 
The closer the black holes, the larger the amplitude of the detected signal. The mass of the black holes can be changed. The lower the mass, the higher the frequency. So changing the mass of the black holes changes the frequency of the waveform and changing the distance stretches it out in the vertical direction, it changes the amplitude. So what that's really saying, that was my colleague um, uh, uh, Laura there from Portsmouth, um, uh, what it's basically saying is that um, we can determine the distances and the masses from looking at the details of the shape of the waveform. That's exactly what we did for 150914 and what we can indeed do for all of our events. And this takes us back to a paper, a really crucial paper that was published by Bernard Schutz um, from Cardiff University back in 1986, predicting that someday we might be able to measure the Hubble constant using gravitational wave observations, getting the distance using this method as just described there by Laura Nuttall. On the 14th of... Oh, um, yeah, now, remember I said that the gravitational waves um, give you the distance, you've still got to get the redshift. Now, for the binary neutron star merger in 2017, we got that from the host galaxy. We could identify which galaxy the gravitational wave event happened in. But what if you don't know which galaxy that is? Well, what Bernard's paper showed was that you could still get a Hubble constant that way. This would be what you call a dark siren. Standard siren is the term that's been developed. It's analogous to a standard candle when you get distances from light. So we get distances from gravitational waves. Standard siren is the name we've adopted. So a bright siren would have an electromagnetic counterpart that tells you the redshift. A dark siren wouldn't. But what you can do is you can look in the region of the sky where the gravitational wave event is, and you can measure the redshifts of all of the galaxies in that region. And you know that, well, it's got to be in one of them. So you basically average over all of them, and that will give you a measure of this Hubble constant, this expansion rate of the universe. So it's a very neat idea, but implementing it is complicated. And we've had um, a number of people in Glasgow working on this um, in the last few years. In fact, we published a paper first as a kind of proof of concept using one event, it was that one, 17814, uh, the first binary neutrons, um, I'm sorry, binary black hole merger that Virgo observed. And that was localized quite well in the sky. Remember I said that was about 60 square degrees. So we could look at what galaxies in a big survey of galaxies called the Dark Energy Survey lay in that region. Well, the disappointing truth was there was an awful lot of them. So you have to average over all of their redshifts. And as a result, you don't get a terribly good Hubble constant. So our guess for the Hubble constant was really sort of spanning, you know, from 40 to 120 compared with the much narrower range from traditional methods like we showed in the earlier plot as well. So to get this to work better, you need more dark silence and you need better sky localization. So we have improved things. So we did an analysis using all of the events in GWTC1. That was 11 of them. So we didn't use quite all of them um, in, in the same way. But uh, in principle, that did improve things a bit. So again, these graphs are slightly tricky to get your head around. But the main thing to just focus on is that this orange curve is the one that I showed before. It's what you get from the binary neutron star alone, and it's not a very good measurement of the Hubble constant. But the blue curve is when you include the dark sirens as well, and it's a bit spikier. It's, we've narrowed in our inference of the Hubble constant slightly more. That's all that this is really showing. You also need to have a good galaxy catalog at your disposal to do this. So we've done some work on improving all of that as well. But let's now fast forward to the situation with the O3B catalog, the one that we've just released. So again, prior to O3, we were still really dominated by that binary neutron star merger, the bright siren, and the dark sirens improved things a little, but not really very much. So now if we go to the latest results, we've now got a lot more events that we can include. So we actually included a total of 47 out of the total catalog of 90. So that was making a selection on the ones that were strongest and, 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 and most uh, well-defined and to try and give us the best chance of really pinning down this Hubble constant. So these are sky maps 
The sky localizations of the gravitational wave events are shown in the colored shapes. So what we've basically got to do is average over the redshifts of all the galaxies within those individual sky localizations. And the bottom line is, this is what we get. So the plot on the right is the one we had before. It shows the original binary neutron star result. It shows the slight improvement using the dark sirens from our first catalog. And now, exactly the same scale, you can see our Hubble constant using all the sirens from our new catalog. So what that's indicating is that we are kind of homing in on the Hubble constant. We've got a way to go yet. We're still not getting it accurately enough to favor one uh, value over another, although it must be said our peak um, seems to be favoring the lower value of the Hubble constant, but it's really too soon to say for sure. But definitely there's, there's good prospects for us doing that better in the future. Um, so looking ahead, that this is a plot that I didn't produce, someone else did. They were um, speculating that if we had as many as 15 binary neutron stars, then that would reduce our error bars, our uncertainties. We don't have that yet. We've only got one binary neutron star with a counterpart, a bright siren. But what I'm saying is that you could probably do just as well if you have lots and lots of dark sirens, especially if they're well localized on the sky. Right, let me skip this one just to save some time. Um, so where does that leave us just going forward? So again, sorry for overrunning, but it's a, a very rich story to tell. And I just want to leave you with a few comments on what comes next. So our third observing run ended in March 2020. We've announced the results from the third observing run, although there'll be more results to come. The slide I just jumped over was to do with that, but again, just have to wait. The, the paper will be out in a few weeks. But what's going to happen in 2022 is that our detectors will come back online again and will be joined by CAGRA and then later, uh, CAGRA's in Japan, and then later in the decade, we'll also be joined by LIGO India, probably towards the end of the 2020s. And what's happening alongside that is that each detector is also being made more sensitive, a variety of um, instrumentation upgrades so advanced LIGO has been turned into A+, and there's, again, similarly, an advanced Virgo Plus program. Um, so all of that will, that sensitivity curve that we looked at way back, you know, the complicated noise curve, it's pushing it down. It's allowing us to be sensitive to more and more distant events. So we've just put out this on our webpage a few um, weeks ago, um, just indicating what the game plan is that we're planning to start 04 in December 2022, our fourth observing run. And at that time, we're looking to get our sensitivity for binary neutron star mergers quite a bit deeper than it has been up until now, approximately 200 megaparsecs. <clears throat> we can actually see black holes much, much further away than that. Indeed, we can even sometimes see neutron stars further away than that. This is just a kind of average measure that we go for. And it's just an indication of the progress in the sensitivity of the detectors. So that's what we've got to look forward to in a few years time, is the analysis of the data that we'll begin to collect in approximately one year's time. So we're gearing up for that now. We're planning how we're going to do all of that and trying to understand what computer and um, software and hardware we're going to need to carry out the analysis of all of that data. Um, adding those extra detectors will greatly improve the source localization. Remember that plot we showed before with the interlocking rings? Well, again, if you have even more detectors than three, then you start to get the sky areas really down to um, tens of square degrees or maybe even less than um, 10 square degrees. So that's going to be a big improvement as well. Um, now, yeah, let me skip these. These relate to projects that are planned for the 2030s. So there's plenty of time to invite me back to talk about those uh, between now and then. Um, but given that I've run over by quite some margin, I do apologize for that. But I hope you've enjoyed this journey through the six years of gravitational wave astronomy since the first detection. And I hope I've convinced you that the field has got a very bright future ahead. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you ever so much. That is just fantastic. Um, it is just 
amazing how you managed to kind of guide us along the path of the story and actually keep people with that. That is so well done. Thank you ever so much for that. Um, it, it is just an astonishing story, actually. Six years is no time mm -hmm. to have, because, you know, the vast amount of work people are putting into increasing the sensitivity of what you're doing um, doesn't happen at the weekend. And in six no, years, indeed. you've managed <laughs> to move this along in yeah. massive steps. Um, it has the feeling of something that once you once you get the next stage and the next stage, the data will just erupt. You know, it, 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 it's an exciting... It's a very interesting point. I think that, you know, there, there's two aspects to that that I'd just, just briefly comment on because that's, that's a great observation. Firstly, um, you know, it's, it's sociologically been quite tricky to make the case to the rest of the astronomy community, look, guys, we need some time for the detectors are offline. You know, it's, it's selling them yeah. on, the, on the prospect yeah. of the improved detection rates in the future. But no, they, they just want us to keep going. You know, why can't you just keep them switched on now? You know, so that's been interesting, just selling that story. And then the other part of that, again, you know, I, I, I can reflect on this from, from direct experience. Um, I, I was sort of overseeing the release of all the new catalogue data and it actually was flying to London that morning. I've, I've only done it, you know, once in a year and a half, but I had to go to a meeting at Queen Mary College and I was in uh, the airport early on, on Monday the 7th of December, the day of the release, uh, or was it Monday the 8th, whatever the day was, um, and uh, I, I was tweeting from LIGO and I was like in real time responding to the tweets from Jonathan Amos, the BBC science correspondent. And Jonathan was commenting how this was amazing, but it was really striking how quickly we'd gone from, you know, earth shattering, groundbreaking discovery to just almost like routine occurrence. You know, he said, you never told us it was going to be this easy. And again, I said, well, look, it's not easy, but it's nonetheless a testament to all of those people that have made this possible in just six years. Yeah, no, it's a phenomenal story. Absolutely phenomenal. If there are questions um, from anybody on, on do, do come on to video and, and speak to Martin. Yeah, well, yeah, you can't, I, I, you can't I, see me. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Ken. I was going to I'll let you go, go first. I was just going to, to say not a question so much as uh, Martin, you can't see me actually just now. What a brilliant, fascinating, exciting talk that was. Absolutely, Thank you. absolutely brilliant. I was totally entranced in 2016 when you came to the Society to talk, first of all, yeah. as a, a fabulous subject. And I'm now truly, truly amazed and waiting for the next the next instalment. <laughs> so yeah. personally, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry, sorry, Ken. Um, I've got a question and a comment as well. Um, my, my first comment is I was fascinated when you, when you mentioned that when two black holes merge, the total mass is less than, than the mass of the two components. Because I thought that the only way in which a black hole could shrink was through Hawking radiation over an extremely long period of time. And, and of course, that, that energy must be the obviously the, the gravitational waves. That's the, my comment. But uh, my question is, uh, you also mentioned that um, about a second later or so, there was this electromagnetic radiation measure. Yeah, just to be clear, that was only the binary neutron star merger. We ah, don't think right. there's any electromagnetic radiation emitted when black holes collide. But if I may just go back, again, I, um, I'll share my screen just for a moment because it's good to be able to see everyone. But I think yeah. I just want to show one image uh, that will be relevant to that question. It's, it's a really good one. Um, if I think if I just go to this presentation, it'll come up quickly enough. It was the image that I showed just towards the end. Yeah, this one. Um, yeah. So this is a cartoon, of course, you know, it's not really going to look like this. But what you're seeing here was this hierarchy of mergers. Yeah. And it's in the vicinity of an active galactic nucleus. So it's in the disk of gas surrounding actually a supermassive black hole. Um, that we think is lurking at the centre of an EGN. So um, two things are relevant there. One is, it could be that even though there isn't any radiation given off when the black holes merge, other than gravitational radiation, mm -hmm. there could still be a kind of electromagnetic flash associated with all the gas being disturbed in That's the EGN right. disk. And in fact, there was a suggestion 
almost demonstrating the usefulness of us putting these public alerts out, associated with that 1905-21 event, the one that was the really massive one, um, there was a suggestion by a group in Caltech that they had seen a flash from an AGN that was in approximately the same area of the sky and at approximately the same time. Now, we don't think, having analysed it more carefully ourselves, that it was close enough in the sky to match up. But that's the kind of thing that we've really got to look for. I think the simple statement I made that the black holes don't give, on, give off any EM-associated radiation, that's to do with the merger itself. But there could be EM radiation associated with what's going on around right. that would still be good enough to tell us, ah, the black hole merger happened in that galaxy. That would be hugely useful. So these dark sirens that I was talking about at the end, where you have to average over all the possible host galaxies, maybe it's not that bad. And, and we need to understand if that's the case. So that's why the multi-messenger aspect of this is so important, being able to follow up with EM observations just in case there's some light emitted. But the one where there definitely was light emitted was a neutron star merger. And right. that produced a gamma ray burst and actually was seen all across the EM spectrum. So that's our one nailed on example of multi-messenger astronomy really working for us. Right, brilliant. I've got one more question about, about the Hubble constant. Um, yeah. th there's these two routes that are, seem to be uh, converging onto two different values and uh, yeah. what you're trying to do is close the gap. But it, could it be that the two different routes are to do with the fact that they're being measured over totally different uh, distances in space and that in fact the Hubble constant isn't a constant, that it's slightly well, variable. <laughs> sort of, but let, let me clarify something. The, right. the route which appears to diverge and gives right. a lower value, the number that they're quoting is still the current value of the Hubble constant. So, right. so we know the Hubble constant changes in time. We know that the universe has been expanding and that it was expanding at a different rate in the past. But they've built in to their analysis, a correction for that. They've built in um, an attempt to capture by how much the rate would have changed since ah. the emission of the microwave background. So it's right. almost what you see. What we're really saying is that they may have got that wrong. It may be that the change in the expansion rate um, isn't quite what they think it is, but they do fully expect that the expansion rate will have changed and they have attempted to build that in <laughs> to their analysis. Fantastic. Great. <clears throat> Anybody else want to ask anything or even just make a comment to Martin? Right. What, from your point of view, with all of these potential expansions and uh, new discoveries coming, well, what one excites you? Well, it's actually the one I focused on, which is the possibility of measuring the expansion rate of the universe uh -huh. using gravitational uh -huh. waves. Um, I was an undergraduate student in 1986 when Bernard Schutz wrote that paper. So I can't pretend that it was, you know, instantly on my radar. You know, I was still too busy trying to pass my exams. But I did a summer project the following year, and it was about measuring the Hubble constant. And the person who was supervising that project had read that paper by Bernard and told me about it. So ever since 1986, it's been in my thought, or 1987, it's been in my thoughts that, hey, wouldn't it be great to be able to measure the Hubble constant using gravitational waves? So to have Christine had the chance to do that, you know, it has been one of the biggest deals for me in my entire career. But admittedly, as I said, we haven't done it very well yet. So the prospect of being able to really nail that down and perhaps address, you know, um, the comment that, that, that um, you know, we just heard there, you know, the, the question about could, could it be that the, the inference of the Hubble constant from the distant universe is just like messed up somehow that, that we, we mm -hmm. don't know. It, it, if it is to do with that, it's probably tied up with us not really understanding what dark energy is. So basically being able to bring some new ideas and new measurements to help answer questions about dark energy, that's the thing that excites me most about, about this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Um, uh, it's just an astonishing field. I mean, it, it, everything about it uh, is 
in some ways a surprise. You know, it, it, it's a beautiful field. Well, the big um, cliche that we were probably overusing, I guess, back in 2016 was that we'd opened a new window <laughs> in the universe. I mean, you know, we have. There's no doubt about that. And, and, and the, the nice thing about it is that, you know, just like the electromagnetic spectrum, people don't tell them, don't talk about themselves being an, a, you know, a photon astronomer or an electromagnetic astronomer. They'll talk about being a radio astronomer or an X-ray astronomer or a gamma ray astronomer, or they'll talk about being interested in a particular type of object. You know, all of that's possible with gravitational waves as well. So if you asked, you know, all the other folks in the collaboration, the 1500 or so, what do you get most excited about as, as, as the um, mm -hmm. things going on in this field? You'd probably get a different answer from almost everyone. And that's kind of yes. healthy. You know, the fact that I yes. see the most crucial thing is measuring the expansion rate, that's good for me, but others will think about it in terms of understanding how black holes form or understanding the crust of neutron stars and, and what's maybe going on inside them. So yeah, you know, the, the possibilities are, are pretty boundless. Yeah, you really have opened a door, haven't you, into a whole yeah. new method of looking at this. It's amazing. Yeah. Martin, I can only thank you. If there are no more comments or questions for Martin, 